Let's bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Honor, praise, and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, our God and Savior, for all your wonderful works and the numberless blessings with which you enrich us. Fill us with your spirit and create in us new hearts that we may rejoice over your works and gifts all our days. And at our latter end, receive us into the that kingdom of light in which we shall follow you wherever you go. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's word that's before us this morning are the words that we say in Psalm 98. We also print it for you here in this part of the bulletin as well. One of my favorite quotes from the reformer Martin Luther is a quote that he makes about music. Maybe you've heard this quote before. He says, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God through music. And God's people have always been a musical people, beginning in the Old Testament and continuing into the New Testament church. God's Old Testament believers uh, were uh, a lot of music. They sang his praise as is evidenced by the book of Psalms, and that word psalm in the Hebrew means song. And those, those songs were not only hymns, prayers, they were instruction. Uh, it's too bad that we don't have any of the music that went along with these songs of praise from the Psalms. I would find that interesting. The Lutheran Church is, is, a, is a church that has long had held to, to music and to singing hymns and words of God's praise. And the Lutheran Church is rich with lots of hymnody and beautiful hymns that are hundreds of years old with beautiful melodies. But then again, the Lutheran Church isn't the only denomination that has, it doesn't have a monopoly on good music and good religious music as well. And all of us may have different tastes and preferences in music as well, okay? Whether it comes to religious music or to secular music, many of us march to the beat of a different drummer and that's okay. But you know, one of the things that I've noticed as I, in my life as a Christian, and as in my life as a pastor as well, in the different congregations I belong to, I've seen different kind of personalities and congregations as a whole during worship. Okay? I belonged to and served some congregations where you walk into them, and when, you're, and when you're in worship, it sounds like almost a heavenly choir. Your, all, your ears are ringing with the voices of all of the people singing. I have been to intern in a congregation like that. And yes, there were a lot of talented musicians, a lot of talented singers and the like. It was very beautiful. It was a lot different from the congregation that I grew up in. Okay? In that congregation, you'd come into worship, and you'd sit, and, and you'd be going through the hymns, and you'd look through it. And yeah, there was a few talented singers. In fact, we had one lady that was an opera singer in, the, in this rural congregation I grew up in. 
But as for the rest, uh, this is what I was used to seeing while the organ was playing. I see people there sitting like this, mouths closed, biting their lips, and not a sound coming out of their mouths. Okay? I've served congregations that have sung and are loud, but maybe some people would be sitting there and going like this. One congregation I served in, um, they had a choir, a wonderful choir. Maybe the voices weren't always on key. In fact, one of the most exuberant singers in that choir back in Minnesota, who happened to be the congregational president, and I hope he doesn't ever catch any of the sermons that I preach here or put up on YouTube, Loved the sing. You ever watch, and this is going to date me, you remember that episode from the Andy Griffith show when the church choir was singing and they had Barney singing along with them? This man sounded a lot like Barney. Okay? But you know what? Nobody ever said a word. Nobody ever said a word of discouragement. And this man sang at the top of his voice. And I often told people that when that man sang, that was sweeter music to the Lord's ears, probably than any trained opera singer that could ever sing, and even the angels in heaven. And why was it? It was because he was singing for joy. He was singing out of love and gratitude to his Savior. God's word that was not only in the music that he was singing, but also in the music that, or the word that he heard during the service, the Lord's sacraments, the forgiveness, it was something that moved him to sin. And that is what the psalm writer is talking about in our psalm this morning. That phrase that we hear, sing to the Lord a new song. What does that phrase even mean, sing to the Lord? Or a new song. What is a new song? I've heard different Christians try to say, well, you know, that's kind of new music. It's encouraging new and innovative music in the church. No. Okay? Actually, that word for new that's in the Hebrew language brings us about this idea of not, not only something that is, is new really in, in recent time, but something that is fresh. Something that is actually kind of out of the ordinary. And this is the new song that the psalm writer is talking about. Okay. Kind of echoing the words of Jesus. The old song was kind of the old way of things. The old way of things, the way people thought. The way the sinful nature thinks. The old way of salvation, which was never really a man, a, a way of salvation at all. One of works. One of having a relationship with God based on what we do, based on how good we are, based on the things that we do. And that does not save. That is the fallacy in this world that a person can have a relationship with God and be with Him based on our works and our merits. That can't happen. The new song is based on the new message, the fresh message that is found in our Savior Jesus. Salvation by grace through faith alone, based on the works of our Savior Jesus. That gospel message, the gospel message that our Lord came into this world to save sinners, that he came to seek and to save the lost. The message that our Lord who came into this world was the one who was per our perfection in our place. The reminder that God doesn't say, hey, do your best. No, he says be perfect. And so he came here himself to be our perfection. And we see that in the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. That is what all of our worship and all of our music is centered on. And that's one of the blessings about music in the Lutheran Church. <coughs> it's because our voice of praise our singing comes from this source, from joy. Listen again to the words of the songwriter. 
He says, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known. He has revealed his righteousness to the eyes of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. This is a joy that's based on the gospel message centered in Christ, and it's one that we share with others. It's also our motivation for why we sin. Now, as you know, don't I don't want you to get this idea that as I'm conducting worship and as I've been conducting worship for over 30 years, that I sit and watch what people are doing. Maybe you'd like to focus on what I'm doing during worship as well, okay? Um, I need to keep centered and focused with that. Oh, but sometimes I see things, okay? And I'll see people sitting there during some of the most beautiful pieces of music and just sitting there like this, not uttering a word, okay? And as I've talked to people, I've, I've heard all sorts of excuses that are given, okay? Well, it's a difficult piece of music. Or I've heard people say before, Pastor, you know what? Lutheran hymn music, Lutheran worship music is really a lot like funeral dirges, and they're hard to sing. And you know what? That's really not true. There is some Lutheran music like that, but it's, it's definitely a minority. Okay? I've had some people tell me, Pastor, it's really hard. I've had a loved one that has died, and I would sit with them in worship and sing, and now those sitting and singing and thinking of those pieces of music make it too difficult to do that. I just can't bring myself to do that. Even sometimes I'll see people who sing in other areas, in other venues, but when it comes to singing in church or maybe even singing with the choir, it, it's something, oh, I can't do that. I'm worried about what people will think. I understand what it's What's, what, what, what all of those things are like. Okay? But we have to come back again to what is our motivation? Okay? God's people have always been a singing people. In fact, I was reading something this last week when it came to Christians and the Bible and the music. Um, it was something that was written by a pastor, and I never really heard this before, but it makes sense. And it said, atheism is musicless. It has no songs. It has no joy. It's completely silent. But Christianity has music. God's music. God's praise. Based on the joy that he brings. I've often told people who say, you know, Pastor, so a lot of times this music, this music, it makes me think of my loved one who's in heaven. I can't do this. Well, you know, when we have communion and world, we usually hear it during the 15th communion service, when we get when we talk about how we sing with saints and angels. Do you ever are you ever mindful of the fact that when we worship here, we're just not worshiping here with each other? That the saints and the angels in heaven are worshiping together with us. Really, not much different than when we're sitting with that loved one who was in the pew, but is now in heaven. We're still worshiping the Lord together. And we that is really, isn't that the goal of our faith? Heaven and that blessed, happy reunion? Reason, joy to sing the Lord's praises. It's a joy also not only that we share with one another here that moves us to sing words of praise to our Lord, but to spread it to all the world. The psalm writer tells us this too in God's word. Shout for joy to the Lord, O the earth. Break out the joyful song, make music. Make music to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of music, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, before the King, the Lord. It is that joy of forgiveness, what our Savior has done for us, the gift of heaven, the message of Easter that moves us to, to, to share that with others as well. One of the things I hope you notice that during this season of Easter, during the season of Easter every year, and those first lessons change from the Old Testament and go to the New Testament book of Acts, not only to give us a little piece of early Christian church history, 
but to show us how the resurrection of Jesus moved his people to share that message with the world. Okay? The spread of the early Christian church, which was swift, which was large, which was great in number, was one that was motivated by people who had seen the Lord die and who had seen him come back to life. They had heard the words of the Lord, because I live, you too, you will live also. And that was something that they couldn't help but to share, even when they were threatened with death. They would threaten with death. If they wouldn't keep silent, they'd say, we've seen the Lord alive. We cannot keep quiet about this. We have to share. And it's that same glorious resurrection of Jesus that moves us to share that with others as well. Because it's a joy that will last for all eternity. Listen again to the words of the psalm. Let the sea roar and everything that fills it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with fairness. The psalm writer here brings out something that the Apostle Paul talks about in his letter to the Romans. When he reminds us that because of sin, even creation groans under the burden of sin. And creation didn't sin, but faces the effects of sin. We also hear that even creation under the burden of sins sings God's praises in nature. Okay? As we look at this world around us, Scripture tells us this beautiful place that God created just oozes its creator in the power of God. And when we see the sunshine, when we hear the breeze, when we hear the birds singing, when we hear the water in the rivers and on the lakes, those is echoing God's praise, his creation. And it's a reminder of the deliverance that is not only going to come to God's people, but to his creation. When God comes to judge the living and the dead, to destroy his creation, and take us to a new heavens and a new earth, that blessed, happy union that we all know. It's so easy to lose sight of that. When I was younger, one of the shows that I used to like to watch on television was on public TV. You maybe you might remember seeing some of it. It was a show called Cosmos, and it was by the dead scientist by the name of Carl Sagan. One of the things I remember, he always used to say um, at that show, you'd see him standing before a large screen on which there was a display of the night sky in all its starry splendor. And he would say in a, 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 a mystical voice and with a mystical tone, the cosmos is all that is, or that ever was, or ever will be. Sad to say, there's many people in this world that look at this world and everything around us like that. But this is all there is. This is all there ever will be. And Sagan was really the poster boy of the unbelieving human, standing on the very tips of his toes, peering into the distant heavens as far as the telescopes will allow, and declaring with a blind arrogance, the world is all that is. Who is mine? As God's people, every time we gather to worship, we are celebrating the Lord's glorious resurrection. And that is a reminder to us why we're here, that there is something better that lies ahead. And that the Lord will take us to him. And when we're in heaven, we will praise him forever in everything we say, everything, everything we do. And that's something that motivates us here as we gather together in our worship. Okay? It is that blessed message of the gospel. It is that glorious truth of the resurrection that works faith in our hearts, and it's a faith which says to us, the Lord has been so good to me, how can I keep from sinning? Sing to the Lord in these songs.
The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. You can find those words printed for you on page 13 and 14 in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the collection. 